Hello, students. Uh, we're reading this paper. Hopefully, you're reading the paper. Um, and I wanted to talk about it. I wanted to talk a bit about what it takes to read a scientific paper and how to gain information from it. And also to talk to you a little bit more about myself since you spent a long time telling me all about yourself. Um, and in this article, I found lots of things that I could relate to. Um, so the title is Un The Undisciplinary Journey, Early Career Perspectives in Sustainability Science. So this article kind of bridges the first month of the class where you're describing to me your uh, stories of the journey in your sustainability minor. And then we uh, applied for jobs, and now we're looking at international perspectives, which you are choosing. So it's all a discovery for for me as the educator, and um, we are all, me included, on this journey to becoming experts and um, scholars, professionals in this world of sustainability. So <clears throat> when you read a paper, probably read the abstract before you uh, actually read the actual paper. The abstract is what tells you what you want to potentially gain information-wise from the paper. Um, and so the abstract is different than the introduction in that it is a very truncated version of the entire paper. It goes all the way through the results. Um, and the, I, I admit that at times in my PhD, when it was three o'clock in the morning and I was trying to finish a paper, that I often composed an abstract by pulling the topic sentence from every sentence in the paper. And so you might want to try that sometime and see how that works for you. Okay, so we're on to the introduction, and one of the beauties of online um, openly accessible literature is that all of the citations are hyperlinked, um, and so you can go and explore the reading from a single reading. Um, and so when you think about what is a peer-reviewed paper, its purpose is to lay a breadcrumb trail of human knowledge. So the citation are breadcrumbs that preceded the paper that you're currently reading. Um, depending on the formatting, you know, these might be alphabetical or chronological. These ones are chronological from oldest to newest. I've seen it from newest to oldest. Just all depends on the publication. So, you know, there's a lot of focus in college about like, are you using APA? Are you using MLA? Are you using Chicago? Um, and these formatting tools are really important to help us learn how to use formatting in scholarly literature, but often each in journal has its own formatting, so you end up changing things. Okay, so um, another thing to take a look at when you're reading these papers as you end your career as a college student is how the very first paragraph is like the quickest digestion of probably everything you've read, right, in your, in your pursuit of a particular discipline. Um, and so the very first sentence, the future well-being of people in our shared earth depend on understanding the interconnectedness of nature and society and guiding these print relationships along more sustainable pathways. Um, I think we can all agree with that. And if you think about the paper as being an upside down triangle, that's just the broadest statement you can make. Um, and then consequently, Consequently, inter- and transdisciplinary approaches to problem-driven and solutions-oriented research have gained considerable traction over the past few decades, clearly reflecting the development of the field of citizen of sustainability science. So here we get a, a picture of the, the discipline, the field of sustainability science. And uh, please take the time to appreciate that it's one of the newest sectors of academic inquiry, um, only a few decades old. So, you know, I wrote my dissertation about citizen science and the first paper in America to really use this term and apply it in the way we now understand it to mean was in 2009. So <laughs> it's really not a very long period of time. Um, so as I'm reading the article, I, you know, depending on how much I want to get out of the article, I either print it out or I read it on the computer. 
The benefit I just mentioned of it being digital is that you can access readily the hyperlinks, but on paper you can really write notes. So my paper is all marked up in my uh, physical copy of this paper. I want to point out a few of the key comments that I thought were particularly poignant and things I want you to think about um, as you consider composing an essay on this for our quiz. In reading this paper, one thing you're going to notice is that it's, it's iterative and somewhat repetitive. So in order to communicate your main points and conclusions, in the literature, you have to be repetitive. Um, and so the introduction is broad and the methods and results in the middle are specific details. And then in the conclusion, you get back to that broad statement. But all in all, you'll end up saying what you intend to say at least three times. And um, what this paper does really is paint a beautiful picture of where we got where we are today. Um, and so we see at the beginning of this passage, this idea that sustainability as a concept really grew out of the 1980s um, and from these specific disciplines of ecological and economic scholarship. Now, if you take a moment when reading, whenever a date is referenced, to really like close your eyes and think about what was going on at that time. Um, this is right on the heels of tons of very important environmental legislation in American history coming out of the 60s and into the 70s, Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act. There's more and more people and novel problems are on the horizon because most of the infrastructure and systems in our country are based on a population that is just a fraction of what it is today. Um, and so we, we are starting to feel that we are in a place in our country and the infrastructure is in decline. Things like roads and schools, um, the, all of this infrastructure, how we recreate it uh, affects, you know, should, should encompass a perspective of sustainability. But what we find is that as we start to frame this burgeoning discipline of sustainability, we have two primary um, ways of thinking that inform it. So the deductive environment is bimodal. So what we're getting in this paragraph is this first explanation of this bimodality that we can conceive of sustainability from a perspective from within a discipline in which we're already engaged, um, like within ecology or economics or sociology. Um, or we, the new, new crop of sustainability scholars of which you and I are both a part, um, we look at it from an interdisciplinary perspective. We have different trainings and different backgrounds because as we've obtained our, um, our degrees, the idea of sustainability being a degree at these various levels of scholarship, bachelor, master's, and PhD, or the minor that you are taking, um, this idea didn't even exist. So I got my bachelor's in 2003. There was no such thing as a sustainability major. And I was in one of the first cohorts of environmental studies majors. Um, so that in itself should give you a sense of the nascence of what we're talking about. Um, but the people who immediately preceded me and potentially alongside of me, but just taking a different path, are squarely residing within a specific discipline. Um, and <clears throat> they, they, in a mid-career mid -career perspective, potentially shift their uh, research towards more interdisciplinary sustainability-based topics. Whereas we might be entering this career um, with sustainability at the fore and with interdisciplinary and behaviors and knowledge that we are gaining that our mentors don't even have. Uh, so table one in this paper, Hater et al., um, definitions of different types of mixed disciplinary research. And so when we think about what interdisciplinary means, we really see that there are varying definitions of that concept. So when we think about the mixed discipline research, which might inform sustainability, um, it could include multiple disciplinary, disciplinarity, excuse me, 
Multidisciplinarity is thematically organized rather than problem oriented. Disciplinary boundaries are generally not crossed, but rather different disciplines are considered in parallel. Um, and so as I go through this and read this, I want you to be thinking this is what your essay question is about. Um, like when you think about your sustainability education, which one of these terms properly describes what you've experienced? Um, and then to reflect moving forward on the challenges and opportunities provided by that theme in your sustainability science education. So multidisciplinarity is when the disciplines are considered in parallel. Interdisciplinarity integrates perspectives, information, data, techniques, tools, concepts and or theories from two or more disciplines. Transdisciplinarity is a process of collaboration between scholars and non-scholars on a specific real world problem. And finally, undisciplinarity, which is problem-based, integrative, interactive, emergent, reflexive, and which involves strong forms of collaboration and partnership. <clears throat> so these are different ways to conceive of sustainability. Um, and I want you to think about which process you feel like is being done to you or has been done to you in your sustainability minor. And think about which one you'd like to pursue, if any at all, if you perceive um, that you might want to attend grad school and continue your education. <clears throat> so getting back to this history of sustainability as a concept, um, let's think about this idea that there are two approaches um, for understanding sustainability science. Um, and these are under a larger umbrella considering systems perspective. Okay, so, so there is the pathways to sustainability approach described by Leach 2010 and the resilience thinking approach described by Folk in 2010 and 2016. Um, and so they have distinct origins that lead to differences in ontology and epistemology related to the nature of scholarship. Um, and so essentially with the, sustain the pathways to sustainability approach, um, there's a human-centered environment of learning where we have human well-being and just governments as the start governance as the starting point for sustainability. Um, and then resilience thinking, on the other hand, has its roots in ecology. Um, and so it's it's shaped more by a worldview driven by the biosphere rather than um, the humanity upon it. When we think about uh, the sustainability Venn diagram, you can see these parts coming in. So in the sustainability Venn diagram, um, we can define sustainability with the major tenets of social, economic, and environmental focus. Um, and then if we can possibly integrate all of these, then we have reached this principle of sustainability. Um, but as we work towards that, there is concentric nature to these circles. Um, and so we see here viable, bearable, equitable, these ideas that we can be approaching sustainability, um, but that <clears throat> those approaches might favor, you know, humanity or economics or the environment over one of the three. Um, and so as we think about this and we get back to the paper, uh, we've seen reference to all three of these tenets of sustainability so far in this paper, and I think we're still on the first page. Um, <laughs> we saw that there were roots from ecology and economics disciplines in the early 80s that gave rise to sustainability conversations, and um, that resilience thinking is driven by in roots in ecology and that the pathways to sustainability approach has roots more in that social dimension. Um, one of the things that the authors emphasize here is that there is a potential disconnect between, you know, the mentors in the field of sustainability and the reality in which you live. So if your mentors arise from these independent disciplines, um, you know, economics, 
uh, so sociology and ecology just as some primary disciplines to link the sustainability Venn diagram to. The reality that we are experiencing is one of interdisciplinary nature. So as we've talked about all three of these tenets, we have done it in a holistic conversation, which could potentially put us at odds with our mentors and with an academic career path in which a certain linear path within a discipline is favored um, to achieve tenure within the academic process. So thinking about that rigid path, um, I didn't take it. And so I, the thing I wanted to talk to you about are the struggles that I face. Um, and so I have a bachelor's degree in environmental studies and I have a master's in biology and I have a PhD in education in which I studied data reliability with citizen scientists. Um, and so what I want you to think about is this is this is one of the tables in the paper. Um, and so when you you move forward and think about how this applies to you, um, think about where you might land with what eggs are in your basket right now, the education you have right now. Um, so so this basic idea here is that there's. Excuse me, let me just tell you, this is figure three in the paper. Um, so the basic idea here is that when we approach sustainability science um, from either a disciplinary or an interdisciplinary space, um, we need to move towards the upper right quadrant. That's the goal, that we can create a reality for sustainability science. But we might find ourselves hemmed in by the concepts of our discipline, or we might find that we are uh, uh, we have knowledge in, in a number of disciplines and areas, but we fail to express, you know, an excelled skill or knowledge in a specific di dis uh, discipline. And that would be this conceptual la la land in the bottom left corner. And I will say that in my career, working through environmental studies and um, becoming a restoration ecologist and working with nonprofits and working with citizen scientists, you know, I feel like I've been in conceptual la la land for a long time because I don't really have a lot of boundaries that are confining my space. Um, and one of the quotes that I just loved from this paper that I felt really connected to was this idea that the undisciplinary space is the arena in which the large undisciplinary journey happens, a space in which there are no boundaries to guide you, but also no boundaries to hold you back. And so when I think about my own career, I have created a lot of things and those things live on without me, you know, as I've moved on to other projects. But I have failed to succeed in gaining tenure in academia. And it's because of this undisciplinary journey that I've been on. Um, and so it's easy to live in a space for me where I feel uh, undervalued. And so as I have been able to achieve, you know, employment in academia for the last 10 years. I've been living in this uncomfortable space um, where I feel like I don't know where I belong and I know what my skills are, but I apparently don't have the skill in communicating that to other people. Um, but I know that on the ground, my academic background allows for me to put boots on the ground, to work in the realm of sustainability science and to publish in the realm of sustainability um, using citizen scientists, using my disciplinary immersion of my master's program in biology to ensure data reliability, but also using, oops, sorry, all that I've gained in conceptual la la land interacting with people, human beings, and nonprofits on different landscapes 
Um, all the time I've spent here, I've gained a lot of skills. And so moving from this uncomfortable space to this place where I am valued in my work environment is really an issue of communication, right? I need to find a way to communicate what my skills are and help people to see what these myriad interdisciplinary experiences coalesce into as my chief knowledge and my chief skill. Um, and so when I was reading this paper, I just really wanted to share that with you and be humble and let you know that this is hard. This realm in which I hope to be a scholar for the rest of my life called sustainability doesn't currently exist, right? There's there's no job for me at sustain called sustainability at UCCS um, except teaching this class, right? And you would probably laugh if you found out how much I got paid to do it. Um, and so that's where that uncomfortable space comes in where it feels like I am being undervalued, but I do have skills and hopefully over time they'll be recognized. And so the authors of this paper um, really lean on the term undisciplinary to reflect on what this might look like, right? How these this bimodal existence within the general framework of sustainability might be treated as a uh, systems process that we can actively mold and evolve over time. Um, so they wanted to ask their subjects who they queried in their research, what does undisciplinary mean to us and to others and what challenges and opportunities come with doing undisciplinary research? And then finally, how do we address these challenges and take advantage of these opportunities within our current institutional structures? And I'm not going to go through the whole paper with you. I'm going to wrap it up here. But I want you to think as you explore this paper about what has been done to you as a student of sustainability and how this undisciplinary reality might be incongruent congruent with institutional structures. So be creative. Think about what would work. How could we change this? How could we make a system where we could integrate interdisciplinary uh, scholars into a discipline-based system so that we can move forward with the greatest success and um, the greatest knowledge base to be used in sustainability research. Um, so as we go forward, let me know if you have questions, and I hope this was a helpful introduction, and I'll see you in discussion.